everyone, I'm Tony Lontis and this is the Everyday Business Show. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability because if I fail, that means I fail for my entire female nation, I call it. <laughs> Is that possible? That was the question for myself. And it is absolutely possible. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Everyday Business Show. I'm your host, Tony Lantis, and today we have another amazing guest to chat to you with. Uh, but before we do, if you're listening on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, please don't forget to subscribe, comment, like. We love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about any of our shows, just drop us a note in, at info at tonylantis.com. And if you're watching the show live and you're interested in any replays of the interviews that we have, please know that Tony TV has a channel of its own on Binge Networks USA, Hero Go TV, Zondra TV Networks, and Tony TV, the app is available on all LG, Roku, and Samsung smart TVs across the planet, plus your mobile phones. Now, each and every week, we do an important part of our show, which acknowledges the special and important role our Indigenous communities play in the development of our country's cultural identity. And it goes like this. I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region, the traditional owners of the land on which we speak and broadcast. And I want to pay my respect to the elders past and present and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people here listening in the audience today. Now, this week on the Everyday Business Show, I'm going to be talking to Joe Lane, who is a marine biologist, conservationist, and owner of Sea Health Products, a South Coast New South Wales Australia business that hand harvests kelp to produce a unique range of seasonings and skin care from the sea. Joe has travelled the world in 2019 on a Churchill Fellowship to research what was needed to introduce kelp farming to Australia. Since returning, she's focused on breeding our unique kelp species and is ready and inspired to pioneer a new sustainable industry for Australia. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you so much, Tony. Thanks for having me. Now, firstly, I want to start with congratulations on being a Corrales Venture Australia 2022. How does this make you feel? Uh, it's it's so exciting and it's so wonderful to be part of a really beautiful, supportive community of like-minded um women and non-binary founders who just really want to succeed in, you know, the world's to-do list, who really want to help up everybody, um, you know, stand, go up or raise up yes. on everybody else's shoulders to, you know, do what's needed. So it's really beautiful. I'm really pleased. I'm really excited to be, you know, um, chosen as a, as a venture for this year. I'm excited for you too because um, uh, I'm a Corrales um, activator um, and previous venture myself and I voted for Jo because I think what she's doing is amazing, which is why we're having a chat today. But for those that don't know, Corrales is um, a feminine um, movement to um, address the gap in venture capital so across the world um it is male dominated and Corrales is female dominated and they choose ventures or businesses or companies or brands that are working on the world's to-do list and of course they are linked to the UN sustainable goals for development um and if we get a chance I'll talk to Joe a little Congratulations, Joe. Well done. Thank you. Um, 
I wanted to talk firstly before we get into this wonderful conversation about kelp um, uh, in Australia. What was it that started you on the marine biology um, job? Was it something that you've, is the marine ecology something you've loved since you were a child? How did that happen? (laughs) <laughs> well, I do remember dreaming of being a mermaid when I was a little girl. And there had, you go. Had the, had the dress ups. Um, but, you know, we didn't live near the beach, so no, I don't have, but I did enjoy going going to the beach with my family and we certainly did lots of outdoor camping trips. Um, I always actually wanted to be a naturopath. So as I was going through yeah. high school, that, that was my um, dream. Um, and... I took a gap year in after HSC and um, as a Jillaroo. So I was working on a farm, a dairy and sheep farm. So I was also really interested in primary production and farming and food supply and went back and did uh, just a, a science degree. And in second yeah. year, I got a job at an aquarium and that literally changed the direction of my life and mm-hmm. just became totally uh, or in awe of the marine environment, how beautiful it is, and how the, even back then, so it was, you know, when I was in my twenties, you know, the the urgent need to conserve and protect this this marine environment with all the, you know, the beauty, yes. but the the threats to it. So um, I did marine biology. I stayed at the aquarium for a few years, and then I've been really fortunate having a range of different jobs in government positions, working for fisheries. And when I worked for New South Wales Fisheries, I processed the permit of this very interesting company called Sea Health Products. Ah. <laughs> and little did I realise that about 10 years after that, I would buy that very business. So it's been and an I'm so journey. glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we've talked previously about um, seaweed and kelp, there's a distinct difference between seaweed and kelp. Can you tell us what that is, Jo? Yeah, sometimes those words get used interchangeably, but yes. really, um, seaweed is the broad overarching term and there's around 12,000 species globally of seaweed or macro algae and mm-hmm. they're divided into three main groups, red, brown and green, and kelp is a type of brown. So I suppose sometimes the easiest way to explain it is you know, seaweed you could think of as fruit and kelp is like apple, you know, so um, gotcha. all kelp is seaweed, but not all seaweed is kelp. Fantastic. That's a great explanation. Um, So we don't actually have kelp farms in Australia yet, which is an interesting concept because we are a massive island surrounded by the ocean, completely surrounded by the sea. Um, so why don't we have kelp, kelp farms in Australia yet? Yeah, exactly. So we're we're girt by sea, about thirty six thousand mm. kilometers of of coastline, and you know a lot of beautiful pristine waters. Um, and once I bought the business and was ha- hand harvesting, I very soon realised, like, wow, there's so much you can do with kelp I just need more what how how can I do this um so I worked out that I needed to farm it and I was very surprised to find that there are no kelp farms in Australia and now that I've done the research overseas and come back um one of the main reasons one of the biggest barriers is that our unique species um, ah. we don't understand or we haven't funded the research or there you know we don't fully understand the breeding requirements um, of a lot of the species in Australia. So in order to farm it, obviously you need the seed mm. stock. Um, yes. So it's kind of chicken and egg. We need to <laughs> we need to work out how to get the seed before we can plant it out on the farm. So that's been a big barrier and that's something that we've been really focusing on for the last five years and where we've built a laboratory, we've worked with researchers, um, yeah, and we've had success. So a, you know. I was just going to say there's a lot of background that goes into this whole idea of commercial farming of kelp, but you will be the uh, the leader in this industry, Joe. 
Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> I know, it's, ex it's exciting. Yes, yes, we are. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're pioneering kelp farming and it's been, you know, my focus really since I bought the business in 2015, mm -hmm. realising, wow, you know, kelp you can use for food and cosmetics and agricultural feed and, you know, now there's... And it's some, good stuff, isn't it? It's so good. It's so good. It's full of, you know, minerals and nutrients. It's so good for human health it's good as a lot of people go oh yeah, i put it on my garden it's you know yeah. it's well known that it's good for fertilizer um there's some incredible research going on now into using it as a um for bioplastics and building materials and you know so it's it and seems like it's limitless all of the applications Joe, was i i I, um, I recollect reading something about um fodder for animals in particular cows is that true as well well, like I say, there's a lot of different species of seaweed. So, yes, mm -hmm. there is a type of um, seaweed that they're doing a lot of research in and that was founded in Australia as well um, yeah. for reducing the methane from the cattle. So, Farty um, cattle. Yeah, and the burps, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Which I think poor cows, they've got to, you know, get rid of that excess gas somewhere, somehow, yes. but, um, yes. yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's a really versatile product. Exactly. And, and it's um, renewable and sustainable. Yeah. So kelp farming is also known as restorative or regenerative farming. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we collect the reproductive tissue from the wild, from the adults, we don't need to collect very much. And it's literally, you know, releases hundreds of thousands of zoo spores. So from that, you know, one or two, or, you know, we collect a few to get the mm -hmm. genetic diversity, diversity, but, you know, from only a small selection of plants, we can really populate a farm. Um, so, and then from that farm, you know, that creates habitat depending on well, yeah. look, I mean, the other exciting thing, I did start on this mission, yes. you know, for my business to get, you know, to scale the business and grow the business. But now, you know, what I'm finding really exciting about unlocking the breeding requirements is we can uh -huh. get involved in restoration projects as well. <gasps> so um, we can provide habitat, we can restore our declining kelp forest, which is unfortunately happening along the oh, east, east coast okay. of Australia. So you can, you can, so just like growing a forest of trees, correct me if I'm wrong, we can grow forests of kelp and we can harvest it because you can continuously grow it. What's the life cycle of kelp? That's a good question because it hasn't been done in uh -huh. Australia before. We're not sure of the growth rates, but looking mm -hmm. at what's been happening overseas with a similar species, generally you can outplant it on the farm, um, you know, when they're about eight weeks old, they're like as big as your eyelash, they're really cute. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, um, and then after about six months um, mm -hmm. growing in the ocean and mm -hmm. you don't have to feed it or anything, so it absorbs the nutrients it's from the ocean after about Perfect. six months you can harvest it but we're not sure in Australia yet that might what be a do. bit longer might be 12 months it might be eight mm -hmm. months yeah um, yeah you know we've got to do some trials when you um talk about harvesting kelp it, can you explain that process for the audience please Joe? my my day to day is um, get a <laughs> alarm goes off at four fifty. Um, hit snooze and get up at five. Make coffee, jump in the car, head down to the beach, mm -hmm. and we have a license to collect between the tides. So we like to get the kelp as it's rolling in in the morning, mm -hmm. um, and you know that might happen at. And it might not be there, so we go to another beach. And um, but yeah, if it's there, um, we collect it, bring it back to our processing facility, and we wash it in yes. mountain fresh water, and we put it out on racks to dry, to dry in the sun, and then um, yeah, we mill it and we store it, and then we um, package that up and we supply and health food stores, it. and yeah. And then you've got loads of products yourself. So not only do you collect it and sell it to others, but you have products yourself. Can you tell us about some of those products, please, Joe? 
Yeah, so we have just the pure granules, the kelp granules, which mm -hmm. you can use like I, I say, like a natural multivitamin because it's mm -hmm. you know nutrient dense, lots of vitamins and minerals, um, high in iodine. And then we have you can use it like a salt substitute or a seasoning. So we have mm -hmm. um, a range which includes smoked kelp, which we smoke for about seven hours using Australian red gum chips, and we got a mm -hmm. gold medal for that recently. And we also have a Japanese-inspired furikake seasoning, which has chili and sesame seeds and nigella seeds, and that's really popular. And our most recent one is a native finger lime and kelp. That which sounds is really, really good. nice with seafood and on salads and in Thai yeah. dishes. So it's really versatile seasoning that's you know has all these health benefits and then yeah. we also have a few um, skincare products and beautiful soaps um, and bath bags or mm. soaks because um, it's really moisturizing and lovely for your skin and yeah. a, sh a shampoo bar as well oh. so we have awesome. a range yeah joe why can't we just rely on stocks of wild or natural kelp so so the process you're talking about is gathering um natural or wild kelp why is it not a good idea to just rely on the wild kelp why the concept of farming uh well what we're finding is well particularly the last couple of seasons has been quite tough for our business because the mm. as awareness increases demand is increasing Crazy. which is fantastic yes. but we've had this La Nina for the yeah. last two seasons and potentially another one coming which yeah. has impacted the kelp as well as you know temperature increases through climate change mm -hmm. um, and we're also experiencing urchin barrens so we're having a proliferation ah. of sea urchins which is impacting the They're kelp tricky population. little things aren't they they are and they love the kelp as much as we do so ah. they're, they're munching away on it out there <laughs> so we have noticed a decline in the wild um, population and we hence our, the idea to farm and have that cons consistency of supply yeah, definitely, definitely. And we can then, you know, expand into other markets. So we can then, if we've got more kelp, we can do more great things. We can use that kelp for fertiliser and mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, more, more food products. There's a lot of interest in plant-based meat and, yes. um, you know, also like these bioplastics, people are yes. doing great things, but yes. we don't have a reliable supply of Australian seaweed at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Australian seaweed kelp, it is unique, isn't it? Yeah, like I say, we've got, um, you know, approximately 3,000 species in Australia and a lot of them, about 80%, I think, are only, you know, endemic, so they're, they're found mm -hmm. here. Um, the species we've been working with is called golden kelp or Eclonia radiata, and mm -hmm. it is one of the most common kelp that we have here mm -hmm. in Australia found from sort of the the border of Queensland and New South Wales down yes. around the Southern Ocean to around to Geraldton in Western Australia. But it's a really mm -hmm. important habitat forming species mm -hmm. um, that supports the biodiversity. So it also supports the abalone industry and the rock lobster ah. industry. And you know, it's a really important species for, you know, maintaining biodiversity. So, you know, I'm a bit biased. It's my favourite. It's It's got, you know, it's really it makes, pretty. <laughs> it makes sense for Australia, doesn't it? We have all of this ocean and, and I'm assuming, so the coastline of southern um, Australia from, from Queensland and down across um, New South Wales, Victoria, um, South Australia and into Western Australia, that's a massive coastline. So one of my questions is, um, what sort of conditions, what sort of depth does the kelp need? Um, I'm guessing guessing that you you already know all of this um and will it only grow in certain places in certain temperatures under certain conditions or is it pretty versatile it's it likes um this upwelling of nutrients so it, you do uh -huh. actually find it in sort of um high energy zones yeah. um which then you know creates an engineering challenge for you know <laughs> creating yes. the yes. um the you know getting the, the right gear 
Um, but that's possible because they have they are doing it overseas in offshore environments and attached to wind farms and uh, ah. yeah, that kind of thing. So it's all possible. Um, it it likes you know around three metre depth because it absorbs oh. the sunlight as it mm -hmm. photosynthesizes, also mm -hmm. absorbing carbon dioxide and, and nutrients. So relatively shallow. Yeah, yeah. So probably three to eight metres um, mm -hmm. is what we'll be growing. Looking at? Yeah, yeah. So we've um, already secured um, a couple of sites. We've got um, two sites in New South Wales. So we're about to do some outplanting trials soon. That And that was my next question. So do you have to? So I'm, I'm a farm girl, so I'm thinking of underwater fences that... <laughs> barrier to your least spaces for growing the seaweed is that true am I no. or is it is it bloats on the top that just this is the area where the kelp's growing kind of exactly thing? exactly yeah so it's similar very similar to a mussel farm so yes. you have um you know you have your anchors the and frames have, and the yeah yeah and your yeah. your long lines and then the kelp will be submerged but you have the floats across the top and you'll have markers you know around the boundary to keep people from driving their boats I'm guessing yeah well just to notify them that we're there um mm. yeah um and to be aware that the farm's there um but and so you were talking um, just before about the baby kelp being the size of an eyelash. Is that when you plant it at that size in those farms? Yeah. So we collect um, what's referred to as sorus tissue. So the adult plant, um, mm -hmm. you know, gets uh, the reproductive tissue and we've got yes. a permit to collect that. So we go mm -hmm. and collect it from close by to where the farm's going to be. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you get it to release the zoo spores and then so they it's... change into male and female. Yeah. And at that stage we can actually, we, we can put them under red light and ah. they stop um, it sort of pauses and stops them from fertilizing. So that's the other exciting thing. We can maintain those cultures, so called gametophyte cultures, mm -hmm. um, ongoing. And then that's creating a seed bank. So we've got, you know, gametophytes oh, from amazing. You know, eight different locations at the moment. We've got some from Victoria, we've got some from southern yeah. New South Wales, we've got Sydney. Yeah. So yeah. that's really important for, you know, future restoration yes. projects. Amazing, amazing. Now, before we finish this interview, um, a couple of more questions. Um, when you had the fellowship to travel across and look at all sorts of farms across the world, what were the specific challenges that you noticed Australia would face that other countries don't necessarily have to deal with? I think one of the biggest challenges, um, well, that I've found is the breeding, which we've um, yeah. put a lot of time into and um, succeeded and conquered that. And the other thing um, with Australia is our each state has different regulations. And because uh -huh. this is a new industry, our regulatory process is, is quite thorough, I suppose, but almost, um, you know, making it incredibly yeah. challenging to D yeah. get through. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm definitely an environmental scientist, conservationist, but it, it's in New South Wales, it's considered um, state significant development. So it's the same protocol right. as if I was, you know, building an airport or doing, you know, something right. of a very massive scale. So it's quite costly <sighs> and yeah. Um, so that is one of the major challenges, whereas, you know, particularly in America, they had something called an experimental lease. So you could just uh -huh. tr trial Go 100 try. metres um, uh -huh. as long as it was a native species, as long as you use yes. this, you know, particular yes. type of infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. you could pay, you know, I can't remember, 100 bucks, $500 um, as a trial, whereas, you yeah. know, we don't have that system here at the moment. So we're very risk averse and potentially yep. you know limiting it to such an extent where yes. it's inhibiting an industry yeah. that needs to happen because it has so many right. benefits. absolutely absolutely joe um can you tell the audience where people can find you and your gorgeous um products 
um, and get themselves into some kelp because it is an amazing product from so many different levels. Where can people find you? Yeah, thank you. Um, so our website is seahealthproducts.com.au. So you can That's check easy. us out. It's on and you're on Facebook. And when you're watching this um, interview, if you look below in the show notes, we will have all of Joe's connection and the website and where you can find her amazing kelp products. Joe Lane, thank you so much for your time today telling us about this amazing new industry and its potential for Australia. I'm delighted to have you on the show, delighted that you're doing this work, um, and thank you very much. Thank you. I want to do it to the best of my ability because if I fail, that means I fail for my entire female nation, I call it. <laughs> Is that possible? That was a question for myself. And it is absolutely possible. Is that possible? That was a question for myself. And it is absolutely possible. Is that possible? That was a question for myself.